Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this new uh, Tuesday Scholar Series. Today we begin a new series called After Such Knowledge, Art, Religious Life, and the Holocaust. This series is centered on an art exhibition, Envisioning Evil, the Nazi drawings of Maurizio Lazansky, which is currently on view at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. The series was organized by Rabbi Barry Citrin, who will be joined in this work by Drs. Rachel Magari and uh, Professor and Dr. Daryl Jodak. Owing to some last minute conflicts with the speaker's schedules, we have had to rearrange the order of our topics. Instead of hearing from Dr. Rachel Magari today, as was originally planned, our topic today is mid 20th century art and its challenge to Jews and Christians. Our speakers today will be Daryl Joduk and Barry Citrin. We will, of course, hear from Dr. Magari later in the series. Rabbi Barry D. Citrin, PhD, retired from McAllister College and now serves as Adath Jeshurun Congregation's Senior Scholar. Daryl Jodak, PhD, is Professor Emeritus of Religion at Gustavus Adolphus College. Today's program is brought to you with the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota and the financial support of the Friends of the Ramsey County Library. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn things over to our first speaker, Rabbi Barry, Barry Citron on mid-century art and its challenge to Jews and Christians. Thank you very much. Judy, thank you very, very much. And welcome to all of you. And my gratitude for your participation in this four week series. And on behalf of my colleagues, Dr. Jodak and Dr. McGarry, I also welcome you to this four part occasion by the exhibition now at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. It is a personal honor to be once again in conversation for these first two sessions this week and next with Dr. Jodak. Daryl and I first connected through our shared commitment to interfaith conversation. And over these past 20 years, I must say, he has been a continuing source of wisdom, counsel, and inspiration to me and to our Jewish community. So I hope all of you now can see the PowerPoint presentation which I have raised, uh, and I think it's uh, visible to you all. Um, and we're, again, so delighted to have you with us for this series. On May 3rd, the th uh, third of our series, Dr. McGarry, who is currently actually traveling in Europe for an upcoming exhibit at the Institute of Art, will join us virtually on Zoom to place in context the work of the artist. As you will hear from Rachel, Lazansky was widely recognized for his pioneering printmaking innovations, serving as a mentor to generations of students when he led the University of Iowa printmaking workshop. His work appears in scores of major collections across the nation, and he is especially known for large scale figurative works as those you see here, which are also, by the way, on exhibit at the MIA. Um, those that you see here, the largest of them in the middle is the artist's self-portrait flanked on either side by renderings of his two children, which we are, happen to meet at the opening of their now in their 60s. The drawings comprising the current exhibition traveled the country in the late 1960s and early 70s, actually opened the Whitney when it opened on Madison Avenue at 75th, and the 33 drawings are now housed permanently at the University Museum in Iowa City. Dr. McGarry will personally welcome us as well for the final May 10th occasion, conditions permitting for which we remain very hopeful. To set the stage for these first two conversations, we're pleased to show you a specially prepared video introduction to the exhibition. 
So now I'll stop sharing my screen and Grayson Simmons of the University of Minnesota will take the reins to show us this seven minute video. Hi, I'm Rachel McGarry. I'm an associate curator at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. We are in the exhibition Envisioning Evil, the Nazi Drawings by Mauricio Lozanski. The Nazi drawings were executed in the 1960s by the Argentine-American artist Mauricio Lozanski. He was born in Argentina to Jewish parents from Lithuania, and he emigrated to the United States in 1943. Lozanski began the Nazi drawings in 1961, and he worked on them for the next 10 years. They really represent the artist's personal response to the Holocaust. They're raw, they're expressive, they're haunting, they're colossal in scale. You'll see that Lozanski deploys a cast of terrifying brutish figures, menacing skulls, anguished victims, and his anger is palpable. In 1961, the trial of Adolf Eichmann the notorious war criminal, was underway in Jerusalem. This is the first televised trial that was broadcast across the globe. And at the trial, 90 Holocaust survivors testified. This was a watershed moment as far as understanding the Holocaust as a distinct, catastrophic tragedy of World War II. Finally, the world understood what the Holocaust was. The world was riveted by his capture, by his trial, and afterwards, a number of other Nazi criminals were tried, especially in West Germany. And people really became much more interested in understanding what had happened, in talking to survivors and reading their stories. And filmmakers, artists, playwrights really brought the story of the Holocaust to life. The first thing you see when you come into the exhibition is these Nazi bus that he executed in 1961. And right at this moment, the world is fixated on this trial of Adolf Eichmann. You know, he was tried in this glass bulletproof box, and the world watched this man as survivor after survivor told their harrowing story of how their families were murdered and their villages were wiped out and their families were taken to Auschwitz on trains that Eichmann had organized. And commentators were absolutely disturbed by the ordinary appearance of Eichmann in that glass box. He just looked like an ordinary man, he, a functionary, a bureaucrat. He didn't look like a, a mass murderer. And so Lazansky is really showing these Nazis sort of being consumed and devoured by this evil, you know, the, the, the skull cap, the, the teeth visor, the muzzle. They're, they're silenced, they're dehumanized. As you move through the exhibition, You'll, and you come into the second gallery, you'll see the drawings in which he treats the victims of the Nazis, the six million. Women and children are really central to the Nazi drawings, to their suffering and their agony. And you come upon uh, number 13 here. This is the first drawing you're greeted by when you come into the second room of the exhibition. And you see a female corpse suspended from some kind of scaffolding. And if you look above her head, she actually has her hands grasped as though she's praying. And she's being um, strung by her own garments. Uh, this terrifying beast is, is kind of coming at her along with a bird of prey who looks like he might peck on her. And what I find is such a terrifying detail is this hand coming from the ground and gripping her foot and pulling her foot down into the earth. As you move into this larger space, you'll see a series of drawings in which Lazansky deploys Christian iconography, crucifixions, pietas, and he uses it as a symbol not of Christ's suffering but of the, the Jewish suffering and the martyrdom of the Jews in the Holocaust. As we move forward, and we're standing in front of number 23, you'll see a child crucified on a cross. He's surrounded by these birds of prey, and they've already begun to peck at his body. And he's being held up in a kind of pieta by a bishop or pope figure. On the child's stomach, in very light graphite are two stars of David. These are the only stars of David you'll see in the entire series. Lazansky was focused on the Holocaust and the Nazi drawings, but he also wanted to remember 
all of the Nazi victims, the Roma and Sinti, the ethnic Polish children, the Soviet POWs, and he worried that minorities were at risk in the future for similar genocides. He wanted to universalize the tragedy. And when you turn here to this figure um, on the final wall of a woman crucified on a kind of cross, it's one of the most iconic drawings, I think, in the series. It's really powerful. It's about the, it's about the murder and desecration of the bodies by the Nazis. Um, she's, her, her feet are, you know, gripped in pain. There's blood dripping onto the scripture, scripture that he's scratched out and cut and cropped, and there's blood throughout. And it's, it's a powerful thing to look at. There are thousands of strokes of graphite going across the entire background. If you look at the top part, you can see there's a sheen from how hard he pressed on the graphite, and it goes all the way down to the bottom. And you'll also see tack marks he pulled, you know, he, he was very rough in his handling of, of the drawings. These weren't meant to be, you know, beautiful works of art to look at. These were really, you know, expressions of his, of his, um, I don't know, his <laughs> state of mind in trying to understand the evil that happened. For me, the show really reminds me of the power of art. Um, these are not subtle works. They're executed with purpose and profound feeling. And I think Lazansky's rage combined with his extraordinary draftsmanship makes a powerful statement. These drawings are intense and upsetting and haunting and formidable. It is, I think, a once in a generation chance to see them and you won't forget it. Thank you, Grayson, very much for um, kind of being able now to have us see that extraordinary uh, seven minute introduction. And uh, as you'll see, if you happen to see the catalog, which is available, that Dr. McGarry's study of these drawings is simply without peer, I believe, uh, and quite extraordinary. And these are the catalogs, the catalog from 1976, when they were first shown, and then the, this new catalog, which is quite extensive in everything which it does. So uh, as we saw, um, and the visual tour, and then when you're at the museum uh, next in a couple of weeks, facing these monumental drawings can be indeed, as Rachel said, very unnerving. Uh, and as she briefly mentioned, a number of the 33 drawings make reference to both the Jewish and Christian faith, its adherents and symbols, and to the images which really cry out for commentary. To be specific, these three images evoke the cruciform and the Christian clerical garb. Numbers 22 and 29, those on center and right, seem to depict religious leadership as witnesses to the violence. Number 18, the one on the left, hearkens to the tradition, the Christian tradition of Peter being crucified upside down during the reign of Nero. But in this case, the victims are 20th century European Jews. Several major Jewish artists, most famously Marc Chagall, as you can see here, regularly coupled the central symbol of Christian faith across with the six million. That linkage of the crucifixion with the victims of the Holocaust might seem to some to be a quite artistically transgressive act, potentially offensive to both Christians and Jews. And this is probably the most well-known of the many, many that Chagall did. And this is at, as you can see, the Art Institute of Chicago. 
And I'm guessing that Dr. McGarry might well touch on this in her presentation in three weeks from now. What initially brought me to be especially connected now three years ago with me and this exhibition were those Luzansky images which we just saw, and especially this fourth one, number 23 in the set, the one that concluded to some degree the video presentation. As you can see on the left, and this is the exhibition panel that accompanies the, the drawing itself, um, it, Lazansky's rationale for turning his attention to the church, and therefore ours, is a, apparent about what he saw as the apparent silence and disregard for the acts of discrimination and brutality aimed at the Nazi targeted communities of the European continent. Taken together, these specific drawings, and indeed one might well the same, not only for these four that I've just shown you, but all 33 seem to be counter testimony to our shared aspiration for a humanity at peace with each other. Moreover, the events memorialized in these drawings addressing one of the epic catastrophes of history posed to our two faith traditions, Judaism and Christianity, enduring challenges about personal belief, our professed institutional creeds and tenets, and most especially, our common avowed commitment to scripture's command as we read in both our traditions of Deuteronomy, choose life. Jewish thinkers have responded to these challenges in many ways. Some have urged silence, sort of an acquiescence to the inscrutability of what happened. Others have insisted on offering justification for it, defending traditional theology, a position that almost amounts to blaming the victims. Neither of those outlooks seem intellectually or ethically acceptable to most. And this afternoon, I want to turn to three thoughtful responses that find in the Holocaust a call to action. Jewish thinkers who hear from that wasteland ethical and religious commands for a way forward. Permit me to place all of this in a personal context. So in 1972, just after I was ordained from rabbinical school, our little family moved to Des Moines, Iowa. Sometime during that first year as the congregation's rabbi, I was invited to stop into the synagogue library where about 20 women were gathered. While I don't remember the text under discussion, I will never forget the words spoken by Phyllis Tarp, the woman pictured on this slide. As I was to learn only that same 1972 morning, Phyllis and her husband, Irvin, and their daughter, Selima, were among the younger people rescued from the Holocaust, for they were shielded by Oscar Schindler working at his factory which is shown here. Over our years in the community, we would well become almost as family to the Karks. At some point during that morning, at the very beginning of that, my years in that community, the participants turned to talk about the Holocaust. And they clearly knew about the Karks miraculous rescue. In town just a few months, I knew not a whiff of it. At one point, a member of the group turned to Phyllis and asked her something like the following. Phyllis, might you be willing to share with us your own feelings? Given what you endured, do you still believe? She looked up and quite directly, but also very gently offered a response today that is as piercing today as it was when I heard it 50 years ago. She said, I didn't lose faith in God, not at all, but abandoned by neighbors and friends, I almost lost faith in man. In the years following, Phyllis and Irvin were to become godparents to our youngest daughter born in that town. And though they are now both long deceased, their memories remain closely held within our own family. As our personal touchstone with the Shoah, as the Holocaust is known in Hebrew, I dedicate my remarks to their memory this afternoon. Phyllis and Irvin grew up in Krakow, 
as you can see on the map at the bottom, just a short distance from Auschwitz in Polish, as seen here, Oswiczyn, just 66 kilometers to the west of Krakow, about the distance from the east side of St. Paul to the St. Croix. Today, it takes about an hour to make that story, to, to make that trip to those story killing grounds, as I've done twice over the past years. It's miraculous that the carts' lives and love for one another did not end there. But if one leaves their birthplace of Krakow and heads due west for a somewhat longer automobile ride, one reaches a city very much in the news on this day, Lviv or Lvov, depending on how you pronounce it. Over the past 200 years, that city has had many different names, as you see here, depending on who controlled it politically or who lived there. Five years ago, Philippe Sands, an internationally recognized human rights lawyer, wrote this award-winning memoir. It's about his journey back to that beautiful city where he, had been given, where he had been invited to give a lecture. While the personal connections he has with that city are most engaging in reading the book, his grandfather had actually been born there. The book's focus is on two of the most distinguished graduates of the law faculties of Lvov University, as it was known then. We owe the word and concept of genocide, the concept itself, to Raphael Lemkin, who created the term and defined its legal essence in 1943. And pictured on the right is Hirsch Lauterpacht, who would eventually have an illustrious career as an English barrister, and to whom our world is largely indebted for the concept and legal specifics of crimes against humanity. Lemkin and Lauterpacht studied at the same law school, just a few years apart, just two actually, were schooled in international jurisprudence by the same legendary professor, devoted their careers to the identical kinds of legal violations and would tussle with each other intellectually in the immediate aftermath of World War II. As the case was ready for the post-World War II Nuremberg trials, there was a highly charged debate between the two as to which language should shape the indictment against the captured Nazi government leaders, bureaucrats, and generals. Should it be genocide, as seen here, defined as an attempt to obliterate an entire people? Or was it more suitable to describe it as a crime against humanity, implying that a transgression that is aimed not at a specific collective target, but rather predicated on a fundamental individual right to life as a member of the human family. Professor Sand's book details the fascinating, crucial underpinnings of this consequential disagreement, one that centered on many questions. Could the prosecution in fact prove intent? Was there some concrete evidence, a diary entry, a military directive, some scrap of paper pointing to an order for mass execution? Which accusation could stand up to cross-examination? Which charge, which crime would ultimately matter more for subsequent generations? When the team of prosecutors from the four allied nations the US, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union drafted the charges. These four articles make up the indictment. Genocide, as you can see, was not among them. The prosecution opting for Lauterpacht's terminology. But two years after those trials, in 1948, the international legal world finally formalized in statute what precisely constituted genocide. A dozen years later, at the end of the Nuremberg trials, which ended in 1949, a dozen years later, a Nazi official, as we just saw in the video, who was believed to have survived but had escaped capture, was apprehended on his way home from his factory work in Buenos Aires, in that land where many ex-Nazis had found a hideout. He was known as Ricardo Clement, the world would soon come to know him as Adolf Eichmann. 
tracked and captured by Israeli intelligence. He would be covertly flown to Israel in 1961, put on trial, as we saw in that famous glass booth. And the fourth, and this photograph also shows at the bottom the four groupings of charges brought against him. The trial was groundbreaking for many reasons. The first to be recorded and televised. You can actually go to YouTube, type in Eichmann trial, and you'll actually go to the entire video presentations. Present, televised around the world. The first in which survivors of the death camps, some 90 of them testified. Only one survivor testified at the Nuremberg trials. And as you see on this slide, the first to demarcate genocide alongside crimes against humanity among the arraignments. Hundreds of reporters covered the trial. Undoubtedly, the two most famous were these. On the left, Ellie Wiesel, who would go on to write award-winning books, most notably Night, be honored with a Nobel Prize, address world forums, and represent a generation of his fellow survivors. But as a report on the trial, the four essays that Hannah Arendt, the eminent political scientist, and herself a refugee from Nazi Germany, filed for the New Yorker, were by far the most debated and impactful of all the reporting. This single sentence, a not atypical example of her style, shows why she was so renowned with less than two dozen words, those appearing here in brown, she effectively merges the debate between Lemkin and Lauterpacht into a compelling summary. And wording the assault, a crime against humanity perpetrated upon the body of Israel, she also deftly upends the Nazi claim that the Jewish people were not human beings. For it is critical to remember the language that still terrifies every time one reads it. Nazi ideology had first declared that the infirm and the imperfect were life unworthy of life. Germans considered life unworthy of life. And with the techniques and mechanisms perfected to dispatch hundreds of thousands of German citizens, the German state would then turn that phrase on millions upon millions of religious, ethnic, and racial groupings, such as our daughter's godparents and their co-religionists, and other millions slated to be enslaved to the Third Reich, all of them considered enemies of the state, untermenschen, subhuman. Hannah Arendt's words, the Nuremberg indictment of crimes against humanity, and the guilty verdicts imposed in those post-war years all serve as rebuttal and refutation of those horrifying Nazi classifications. And a warning too, that, would dare, that anyone who would dare follow in that immoral path. Dr. McGarry's essays in the catalog illuminate the way that the Eichmann trial was instrumental, not only in sparking Luzansky's 10-year project to undertake the drawings, but also how the trial and aftermath totally transformed our contemporary understanding of those wartime years. Moreover, as she studied the drawings with me, it became clear that Professor Luzansky was in step with the legal debate within that Nuremberg legal team. The artist unmistakably saw the Nazi descent into evil as one that he was determined to depict as incalculable in scope, envisioning his, his drawings as a vehicle to underline the depravity and cruelty as an assault on the fundamental dignity of all human life. And yet, the identity of the victims is unmistakable the import of who and why they were targeted never far from the viewer's awareness, as you will see yourself when you witness the exhibition. Discrete emblems and markings in the drawings underscore Lozansky's preoccupation with the destruction of European Jewry and its cultural legacy, as well as his anguish at what had befallen all of 20th century European civilization. 
In the decades that followed Eichmann's trial, scholarly reflection on the Shoah has grown exponentially. Its impact on academic disciplines from the social sciences to philosophical ethics, from art to literature to movies, is matched also by the way both liberal, liberal and more traditional minded rabbis and Jewish thinkers have questioned whether their classical faith categories can possibly be reconciled with the, this era's unimaginable evil. Next week, we'll be going over to Dr. Jodak and myself, considering the ways in which our two faith communities have sought to rethink and rebuild a new relationship in the Holocaust aftermath. In the few minutes remaining to me today, I want to focus on the insights of three notable Jewish thinkers who devoted their lives to this subject, along with some conclusions they have drawn for building a possible way forward. Yehuda Bauer is one of those preeminent individuals. A historian of first rank, he is considered one of the most judicious, resistant to conclusions that cannot hold up to the light of compelling definitive evidence. He has been fearless in tackling difficult and contentious aspects, crossing swords, for example, with those who argue that every single German had swallowed anti-Semitism with his or her mother's milk, which he disagrees with. Or by contrast, those who claim that the Nazi turn to genocide was a function only of desperate times and not by intent itself. Beginning with Yehuda Bauer as the first of our three Jewish thinkers seems fitting for this very solemn reason. In 1996, the German National Parliament, known as the Bundestag today, adopted a valiant protocol. Annually, it would mark January the 27th, the day that Auschwitz was liberated and thus chosen for International Holocaust Remembrance Day for countrywide observance within Germany. Yearly, it would invite a distinguished dignitary, a statesman, a scholar, a survivor, to address the assembled lawmakers of the land. And the event would be held here, the rebuilt, extraordinary symbolic seat of government, the, flo the floor of the national community in Berlin. This photo right here, as the vintage automobiles reveal, was how the Reichstag, as it was called then, appeared in the 1920s and the 1930s. And this is how it looks today. The Bundestag. Three years ago, my daughter and I sat in the chambers of that parliament and then joined many others in climbing the stairs of this monumental glass dome that the architect, Sir Norman Foster, configured when the building was rebuilt. He chose a design to symbolize that going forward, the German government and its people were pledging themselves to transparency, to the rule of law by and for all of its citizens. As it turned out, Professor Yehuda Bauer of Jer Jerusalem's Hebrew University gave his address, was one of the first in 1998, the third, and one, one year before this, this structure was dedicated. But his remarks that day attest to the vision of that architect and the people of the 21st century German nation, a remarkable penitential journey that that country has done. Towards the conclusion of his address that day, Professor Bauer offered these words. The Holocaust has assumed the role of universal symbol for all evil because it presents the most extreme form of genocide, because it contains elements that are without precedent, because that tragedy was a Jewish one, and because the Jews, although they are neither better nor worse than others, and although their sufferings were neither greater nor lesser than those of others, represent one of the sources of modern civilization. As perhaps is apparent from these words, one of the many Holocaust inflected debates 
that Professor Bauer spoke to was the apparent uniqueness of the Holocaust. And as these words here suggest, and he would go out of his way to emphatically express elsewhere, the onslaught against the Jewish community certainly bore some elements of singular dimension. Every European Jewish person from infant to octogenarian was hunted for elimination. So were their synagogues and their houses of study, their libraries and their sacred symbols and their Torah scrolls. It was as if, as he suggests here, the aim was to obliterate not just the people, but its entire cultural legacy, a legacy which had birthed Christianity and Western culture and its ethical focus. So perhaps it's no wonder then that these are the words that concluded Dr. Bauer's speech that day. I have spoken today of the book of Exodus, where we read of the Ten Commandments. Maybe we should add these three additional ones. You, your children, and your children's children shall never become perpetrators. You, your children, and your children's children shall never, never allow yourself to become victims. And you, your children, and your children's children shall never, but never, be passive onlookers to mass murder, genocide, or let us hope it may never be repeated to a Holocaust-like tragedy. Professor Bauer's writings are consistently shot through with his abiding fear that what happened to the Jewish people in the 20th century is repeatable against others. And we must take that awareness as both warning and admonition. What the world has seen since, from Cambodia to Rwanda, from the Balkans, to what many fear materializing this very hour in 2022 Ukraine, surely justifies the dread embedded in those commands that he would append to the Decalogue. As the words of the second Jewish scholar that we will take just a moment to look at, Rabbi Irving Greenberg, or Yitz, as he came to be called, that being a shortened form of his Hebrew name, Yitzhak. Like Dr. Bauer, Irving Greenberg, Rabbi Greenberg has been best with biblical length of days. Yehuda Bauer is today 96. Yitz is still teaching and writing, still a beacon to the world Jewish community at the age of 89. And the communal positions that he has held reads like a roster of the most illustrious, leading notable mo modern Orthodox congregations, heading renowned communal programs, leading the presidential commission that will the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC into existence. In 1974, he was invited to give the opening address at one of the first major international gatherings of Holocaust scholars and communal leaders held at New York's mighty St. John the Divine Cathedral, near neighbor to Columbia University on Manhattan's Upper West Side. For many years, I regularly assigned his extraordinary essay, found in the book shown here in red. Next week, I'll have occasion to turn to his insights from the volume pictured here on the left. A little of the, perhaps a third of the way through that 1974 address. Dr. Greenberg cites the testimony given by a guard when cross-examined by the Nuremberg prosecution. Under testimony, the guard had acknowledged that as the killings in the death camps accelerated in the summer months of 1944, with Eichmann and his co-workers loading the trains with Hungarian Jews off to Auschwitz at a faster and faster clip. Guards were ordered to alter the procedure for slaying the children. The details are so shocking that I am reluctant to recite them aloud as Dr. Greenberg did that day. After he spoke those words, he spoke as follows to that gathering. In the summer of 1944, a Jewish child's life was not worth two-fifths of a cent. Let us offer then 
is a working principle the following. No statement, theological or otherwise, should be made that would not be credible in the presence of burning children. Professor Greenberg's words are haunted by these words. For him, they are a call to theological humility, a caution against easy faith and grandiose religious proclamations. They bespeak an insistence on coming to terms with humanity's capacity for evil and our obligation to live with unwavering, courageous commitment to fellow and neighbor. A few years back, Dr. Greenberg was interviewed for a book-length retrospective. In the chapter on living in the image of God after Auschwitz, the rabbi is quoted as follows. Spreading consciousness of the Holocaust and one of the, is one of the transforming life and society in light of it is one of the great achievements in these decades. The memory of the Shoah has become an irreversible force for life. Dr. Greenberg's observation and his hope, I believe, have not been misplaced. The revolution in Jewish-Christian relations occasioned by the growing understanding of the Shoah confirms that. And this moment with all of you affirms that as well. Doctors Bauer and Greenberg here in the Shoah communal companions for the way forward. So too does one of the most distinguished Jewish philosophers of the 20th century, Rabbi Emil Fackenheim, born and educated in Germany, jailed by the Nazis on the night of broken glass in 1938, was savvy and courageous enough to escape, eventually making his way to Canada where he would teach generations at the University of Toronto. In 1970, he gave an address at his home campus, surveying the long history of the Jewish people in the land of their birth and their wanderings in the diaspora. He pointed to the transformative events that have altered their people's lives and the generations of their outlooks for the ages. As he saw, the Holocaust was now among those earth shattering events of history that needed a new understanding. As he saw it, a moral Rubicon had been crossed at Auschwitz. A new epic had, was upon the world. In the light of that, he argued that it was no longer suffice for the people, the Jewish people, to heed just the 613 commandments that the Jewish tradition had long identified as incumbent. From now on, the people of Abraham and Sarah, Rebecca and Isaac, Leah, Rachel, and Jacob, whose changed name, of course, would become Israel, adopted by his heirs as their own, would have to heed what he called the 614th commandment, which he defined this way. The authentic Jew of today is forbidden to hand Hitler yet another posthumous victory. We are commanded first to survive as Jews, lest the Jewish people perish. We are commanded second to remember in our very guts and bones the martyrs of the Holocaust, lest their memory perish. We are forbidden thirdly to deny or to despair of God, however much we may have to contend with him or with belief in him, lest Judaism perish. And we are forbidden finally to despair of the world as the place which is to become the kingdom of God, lest we help make it a meaningless place in which God is dead or irrelevant and everything is permitted. Next week with Dr. Jodak, I hope to explore with you the meanings and requirements of these words, which for Rabbi Fackenheim were spoken by, as he understood it, the commanding voice of Auschwitz. But for now, I'm honored to welcome my partner, Dr. Jodak. Thank you. Let me start over. Um, it's, a it's a pleasure to be able to be part of this program today. It's a pleasure to be able to work with my good colleague, wonderful colleague, Rabbi Citron, uh, and uh, also to meet each of you electronically in this way. Uh, what I want to do today is to raise some 
challenges or identify some questions that grow out of the Holocaust that need to, we all need to be thinking about in one way or another. I'm going to be leaving some of the development of the answers to those questions to next week. So I hope it's not too frustrating to be talking about questions without answers. So slide number one uh, has to do with the Nazis operating three different kinds of camps. Uh, one is concentration camps where people were kept for more longer or shorter time. Another was uh, labor camps, hundreds of them, which could be more or less torturous depending on the commandant's policies. And then the, the death camps. These death camps be, were opened in December of 1941 and became known to the American government in the spring or summer of 1942. And in the newspapers, uh, there, were some, there was some coverage of these death camps, but many people greeted those reports with caution because there had been incorrect uh, reports of certain kinds of atrocities in World War I that turned out to be false. So in 1945, when the camps were liberated and the, the newsreels and the newspapers were showing pictures, it came as a shock the conditions under which uh, people had lived in those camps. And uh, in, in my opinion, uh, some of that shock is reflected in Lysansky's uh, drawings, as well as his recognition that various different groups were caught up in, in that um, uh, Holocaust. Um, what increased the shock that people had was, was that uh, the high regard that Germany had uh, enjoyed as a leader in science and a leader in philosophy and theology and the professions. Um, why did it happen there? And another uh, thing was that this nation was a longtime Christian, one third Roman Catholic, two thirds Protestant. Every uh, province had a state church and every student studied religion in school. Why did it happen there? Moreover, um, most of the Jews in um, Germany, in contrast to Eastern Europe, were middle class, well integrated into the overall population. They were doctors and scientists and business leaders and war heroes. They lived in the same neighborhoods. They went to the same schools. They worked in the same offices. Why did it happen there? For about 15 years, survivors and others uh, uh, went about trying to find their way into a new life. And those who had been in the army, the liberators, went back and resumed their life with their families, trying to get back to normal. And pretty much the Holocaust was ignored until the 1960s. Uh, I remember listening to a black man from Philadelphia who told about being a liberator of one of the camps and coming back to the United States and not saying a word about it, either to his family or to anyone else, until as a principal of a middle school, uh, three or four decades later, he walked by a classroom in which they were discussing the Holocaust and some of the students weren't paying attention. And he just opened the door and walked in and said, listen up, this is real, I was there. And uh, all of a sudden the floodgates uh, opened and he became very active in Holocaust education but it's indicative of the fact that the shock, though significant, was not um, followed up by a lot of attention for the first 15 years. Rabbi Citron has already talked about the Eichmann trial, and that was one of those things in the early 60s that changed this so that more attention would be given to the character of the causes and the implications of the Holocaust. So slide number two, gradually people faced another challenge. How was it that the Jews specifically had been targeted for destruction? To be sure, they were not alone. The Roma, or sometimes known as gypsies, were also assigned the same fate, total destruction. But because they were harder to find, and because they were less the center of Nazi propaganda, about one third of them were killed, whereas two thirds of European Jews lost their lives. And the Slavic peoples were also considered to be informed inferior, not subject to total annihilation, but fit only for slave laborers. Large numbers of Poles and 
Ukrainians and Belarusians were killed by special units that followed the armies into, into Eastern Europe and rounded up Jews and Slavs and others, shot them and left them in large uh, mass graves. The rationale for all of this was a sense of racial hierarchy that claimed that in former inferior races, if they mixed with the superior Aryan race, would weaken that Aryan race. And, uh, and, 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 and uh, all along the line, religious dissidents, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses um, and, and political dissidents had, had put into concentration camps, but they also were now often put along uh, into the death camps. Now, where did all of this come from? One source, I think, is a history of Europeans thinking of themselves as superior, a tradition that had grown up since the 1400s. Another is some of the anti-Judaism taught by the church. Centuries of both of these things had influenced the background of this racial hierarchy. Uh, we need to distinguish between anti-Judaism and anti Semitism as we go along. Anti-Judaism is a religiously based opposition to the religion of Judaism. Anti-Semitism is racially based and is directed at all Jewish people. As tragic as anti-Judaism was over the years from the Middle Ages and on, it had one important limitation and that was that murder was excluded. But Nazi anti-Semitism broke through that barrier and killed with impunity. When the distinctions were racial, it didn't matter anymore whether a Jew was an observant Jew or an Orthodox Jew or a reformed Jew uh, or um, a war hero or whatever, or had uh, converted to Christianity, they were racially Jewish and subject to expulsion or destruction. The post-war studies of, uh, of a French historian, Jules Isaac, documented the history of anti-Judaism. And we could say that its effect was that it created the image of Jews as the other, and that uh, this made Nazi anti-Semitism seem plausible. And so it took root, root relatively easily. The strange anomaly is that none of the Nazis could figure out how to determine who was racially Jewish. And so they relied on the religious stance of a person's grandparents to decide. So on, a religious test was used for a racial category. Looking back, rabbinic Judaism and Christian church grew up side by side with a good deal of interaction from the time of the destruction of the temple in 70 on through the 300s. What changed in the fourth century was that Christianity became the religion of the empire and had political power. During the Middle Ages, the social arrangement of Christendom um, gave Christians a privileged status in laws and policies, and only they could be citizens. Princes would allow Jews into their territory when it was convenient and expel them when it was no longer. And so uh, they became viewed as outsiders, subject to stereotypes, to rumors, conspiracy theories. And then when the church was also teaching that they were being punished for having killed the Messiah Jesus, uh, things uh, just perpetuated. As early as 1945, some churches issued statements that rejected anti-Judaism. But what really opened the doors to change was Nostra Aetate, a document, a statement on uh, relation to other religions that was passed in 1965 by Vatican II at the assistant, insistence of Post John XXIII, who himself had saved Jews during the Holocaust and been influenced by his long conversations with Jules Isaac. Given the size and the influence of the Catholic Church, this document opened the door to a new chapter in Jewish-Christian relations. And as Rabbi Citron has said, we'll discuss more of this next time. The point is, in addition to the question of how a leading European nation could commit genocide, there was also the second question. If anti-Judaism had played a role, how could Christianity reform itself so as not to perpetuate anti-Judaism and thereby contribute to anti-Semitism and its tragic consequences? 
slide three. Still another reaction occurred. The challenge of photo that, that are, that's illustrated, for example, in photographs that show clergy surrounded by Nazi flags holding up their hand in the Nazi salute. Um, this raises the question of how large numbers of Christians could support uh, Nazism. Now, even Nazism, apart from death gaps, Nazism with its glorification of Hitler, Nazism with its disregard for the rule of law, Nazism with its ruthless treatment of political dissent, with its intense nationalism, how could uh, Christians and religious folks uh, support that? Hitler's initial policy was to try to win over or at least to neutralize the church. He claimed to be a supporter of Christianity. In 1933, he negotiated a concordat with the Pope that settled a 60 year controversy between the government of, um, of Germany and the Catholic Church over parochial schools and the like. It was seen as a diplomatic triumph. In 1933, uh, 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 it, with regard to uh, with that, that uh, concordat, the 1933 included one phrase, a part that seemed innocuous at the time, but proved significant later, and that was that the church should refrain from being involved in politics or having a Catholic party, and it undercut some of the potential Catholic resistance. With the Protestants, Hitler tried to win favor by creating a unified Protestant church, something that had never been before. There had never been a national church. There had been only territorial or regional ones. And that won support for a moment, but included in the constitution was a so-called Aryan paragraph, which prevented people of Jewish background or married to someone of Jewish background from serving as a pastor or any office of the church. This prompted a reaction. A pastor's Emergency League, as it was called, um, organized by a famous uh, uh, World War I hero pastor, Martin Niemöller. It object, this document objected to the interference of the church in the inner life and workings of the church, of the state and inner life workings of the church. And some 7,000 out of roughly 21,000 clergy signed it. Despite these objections, uh, and others, Hitler was able either to win support or to harass his opponents in such a way as to neutralize much of the influence of the church. There were exceptions. Then the Roman Catholic side, Bishop von Galen uh, preached uh, and had the sermons printed against the euthanasia campaign that targeted those of mental illness or physical disabilities. And, uh, it uh, helped to inform the protest that eventually stopped that program, uh, postponed, uh, uh, stopped it for the rest of the world. He also preached about the disappearance of people without trials and harassment of the church. And uh, these sermons were printed and became encouraging to other groups, such as the White Rose, a group of students at the University of Munich who printed and distributed leaflets, anti-Nazi leaflets, including one that was uh, uh, criti criticized the Nazis for their treatment of the Jews until they were arrested in 1943. And within the Protestant church, there was ongoing resistance from the so-called confessing church, a movement that grew out of the pastor's emergency league. And one of its leaders was the Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer who spoke out against the Nazis from the very beginning, indeed from the very day Hitler took office. He later taught at an illegal seminary for clergy uh, that was closed down by the Nazis. He helped uh, Jews get to Switzerland. Though he was a, pac a pacifist, he served as an international liaison for a conspiracy of intelligence officers and military officers, political leaders, religious leaders, who tried on several occasions to assassinate Hitler, arguing that this was the only way to stop the war and save the lives of millions. He was one of the few church leaders who recognized the importance of standing up for Jews as distinguished from resisting uh, the policies of the Jews internal to Germany. And he saw more clearly than others that Christians must have an independent voice in order for them uh, to do this, they have to rethink 
the role of government and re-envision that. So we're left with three questions. First, how could a civilized society organize a mass movement, a mass uh, execution, uh, murder of so many of its citizens? Second, how can Christianity reform itself so as not to contribute to anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism? And third, how can Christians re-envision the relation to political ideologies and political movements? This brings us to challenge four, slide four, please. How could, um, how can or could Christians and Jews overcome their isolation? As we said, by 1932, after a century of progress, Jews and Christians in Germany were relatively well integrated. So what Hitler had to do in order to carry out his policies was to disentangle them and to isolate the Jews. He did this by a series of measures between 1933 and 38, which uh, excluded Jews from working in the, in, the, in the national bureaucracy, excluded uh, Jews from working uh, in, uh, in non-Jewish homes uh, and non-Jews from working in Jewish homes by boycotting Jewish businesses, a lot, loss of jobs, confiscation of businesses, uh, eventually exclusion from schools, destruction of synagogues and so on. So by the time the Jews were put on the trains to the East, they'd become pretty isolated from their Christian neighbors. And this isolation made removal possible with very little dissent. The situation in Eastern Europe was different because there, there was uh, the Jewish uh, residents tend to live in their own neighborhoods or small communities, largely isolated from the other ethnic groups that lived around them. Eventually, they were moved to fenced in ghettos and from there to, to, uh, to uh, camps, but they too uh, were um, uh, isolated from their neighbors uh, and, 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 and that affected what happened. Isolation discouraged resistance and it allowed the Nazis to carry out their intentions uh, with, uh, in a hidden way and uh, by supplying uh, false information. So question number four is how can this isolation be overcome? Not just isolation between Jews and Christians, but isolation between Jews and Muslims and between all three of these groups and Hindus and Buddhists and Sikhs and others. I'll return to these four challenges next time, but let me add two others that are more specific. The first of these uh, is uh, we need a, a word of background and that is that Roman Catholics and some Protestants had taught that the Jews were guilty of putting Jesus to death. This was based on um, passages in all four of the gospels that say that Pilate gave to the assembled people in front of him a choice between Barabbas who had been um, and, uh, led an insurrection and Jesus. And the crowds say, let Barabbas go and crucify Jesus. So the challenge number five is, is this an appropriate interpretation of the gospels? Nostra Aetate, the Roman Catholic uh, document from 1965 said, no, quote, what happened in Jesus' passion cannot be blamed upon all the Jews then living without distinction, nor upon the Jews of today, unquote. And biblical interpreter since that time have pointed out that only that Romans could put anyone to death. Um, so the burden of responsibility falls on the Roman officials rather than on any of the crowds. And even if the crowds did play a role, they were a tiny part of the Jews of that day and certainly not spokespersons for Jews who have uh, been born since that time. So by 1965, the charge of deicide had been rejected by the Roman Catholic Church. And that's an important background for everything that follows. Slide number six. One last question has to do with Luther because he had special, uh, special case. He did not agree with a, a, a position that said that the Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus. So it doesn't fit in point five, but he did write a treatise that the Nazis retrieved from near oblivion and used to claim his authority for what they were doing. Given the fact that he was a more or less a national hero in Germany, this was not an inconsequential claim. 
So what do we make of this? One thing we can say is that Luther's writings as a whole reveal uh, anti-Judaism that he had inherited and been taught by his teachers. He didn't rise above that. So for example, he blamed the rabbis of the first century and the rabbis of his day for distorting uh, the interpretation of the prophets so that they did not refer to Jesus as the Messiah. In point of fact, he was wrong about this because it was the early Christians who had reinterpreted the prophets in the light of their experience of Jesus. The rabbis continued the same traditional interpretation. Another thing we could say is that Luther did not know Jews personally because they'd been expelled from his part of Germany. Another, we can say that in 1523, he wrote a treatise in which he recommended that Jews be treated cordially and permitted to trade and work with Christians so the two groups might associate with each other. It was well received by Jews as a hopeful sign at the time. But then in 1543, 20 years later, he published a terrible treatise on the Jews and their lives. He does two things. First of all, he tries to provide information which was something that he did often, recognizing that the printing press had just been invented and that it was hard to find information. When he could, he would simply um, um, inform uh, people in his printed materials of information that was available. However, he relied on a book by a man named Anthony Margarita, who had converted from Judaism to Christianity and wrote a book that described Judaism in very dark and inaccurate ways. So intending to inform, Luther really provided false information, inaccurate information. The second thing he did was to appeal to the authorities. It's hard for us to recognize in our day that there's a distinction, there was a distinction in his mind and in many others in that era, between an individual's beliefs and what they could teach publicly. The laws prohibited people from teaching publicly anything that didn't agree with classical Christian doctrines. And so when he heard that there, was, uh, there were people teaching Judaism or Sabbatarianism, which was a kind of attempt to put the two religions together, uh, he asked the authorities to do something. And what he recommended was unfortunately way over the top. Number one, to burn down synagogues, number two, to destroy Jewish homes, number three, to take away Jewish writings, number four, to prohibit the rabbis from teaching, number five, to reject safe conduct on the roads, and number six, to prohibit usury. It didn't help that his chief Roman Catholic rival, John Johann Eck, had written an equally uh, terrible uh, interpretation of the Jews because Luther's treatise in and of itself is beyond defense. The two largest churches in this country and the Lutheran World Federation made up of 90% of the Lutherans in the, in the world have rejected uh, these, this document and Luther's teachings. And uh, the ELCA has gone on to pledge itself to quote, live out its faith with love and respect for the Jewish people, to seek increased cooperation with the Jews and to oppose any contemporary form of anti-Semitism, whether in church or society. So then why not abandon Luther completely? Um, the churches have not done this because uh, Luther, in the words of Eric Gritsch, a uh, Luther scholar, violated his own theological principles when he wrote that document. Uh, one of those principles was that you couldn't know the inner workings of God's judgment, and he claimed that he knew that God was judging the Jews. A second was that you couldn't uh, say any uh, with uh, claim authority for anything that you couldn't um, back up in the Bible, and, uh, and Luther went beyond the Bible, because in Romans 11, Paul says when asked whether God has rejected his people, he answers emphatically, by no means and then goes on to say that the gifts and promises of God are irrevocable. So Luther violated his own principle with regard to caution, with regard to claims to God, and violated his own principle of scriptural authority. There, so it's possible, therefore, to hold to Luther's theological principles while rejecting these aberrations in his thinking. Uh, and it also fits with his own sense of humans, uh, no matter how pious or knowledge humans are still flawed and sinful, and he himself was not exempt. 
One more thing, was Luther a Nazi? It's um, an anachronism to ask the question, but let me venture in with some answers anyway. Racial theories were of course unfamiliar to him, but they also went against his view that God had created every human in the image of God and everyone, no matter if they're uh, Christian or Muslim or whatever, real recipients of God's gifts. He agreed with the church's insistence that the lives of people needed to be protected, Jews included. He argued that individuals should have religious freedom, even though uh, they were prohibited from teaching publicly by the laws of his day. It's hard to see how he would have ever endorsed Hitler's claims uh, to be Messiah-like savior of Germany because he was routinely critical of the leaders of his day. He certainly would have opposed um, any kind of uh, invasion uh, of the Nazi invasion of Poland or any of the other countries of Europe because he insisted that church people could uh, participate only in an absolutely defensive war. So um, there, I think it's safe to say that, uh, that he would not have been a Nazi, even though his treatise was retrieved from obscurity and claimed to be his authority. So I hope that I've articulated four questions that deserve more attention, and then two at the end that I've been able to kind of um, dispense with by giving you some answers. This coming week, I think you'll be receiving some documents, including the ELCA Declaration to the Jewish Community that repudiates Luther and pledges its ongoing uh, cooperation and all are part of Nostra Aetate. Um, so Barry and I look forward to any questions or comments you may have, and I open the door for that now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, for, uh, Rabbi Barry Citrin, Professor Daryl Jodak. And now we are ready for questions. And so I'm gonna to say to the audience, this is your chance uh, to say uh, what you have to say. Please put your questions in the Q&A column and I will read them to our speakers. Uh, we have one question already. And uh, the question is, uh, please post, uh, I believe this is directed to uh, Professor Jodak, uh, please post the questions to consider for next week. Well, rather than putting them in the chat line now, I I'm going to ask you, Professor Jodak, to send them to me, to email to them to me, and I will uh, distribute them uh, to the, the uh, viewers so that we'll all be able to think about them uh, over the course of the, the week. Um, so we are uh, ready for questions here uh, while we're uh, waiting for questions to come in. And again, please put your questions in the Q&A column so that I read them in order. Uh, but I will ask a question of my own. Um, and I guess I'm going to direct uh, my first question, uh, well, really to both of you, but I, I was struck by the um, uh, congregant uh, that uh, uh, Rabbi Citrin uh, talked about. I believe her name was uh, Phyllis. Um, well, Phyllis is the name, Kark maybe, um, the, from the Iowa congregation. And uh, particularly in view, you know, her statement, I almost lost faith in man. And I must say that, you know, we uh, are now once again reminded of the bloodstained history of the same part of the world that figured so prominently in World War II. Uh, and I think about her comment in, in light of uh, developments in Ukraine, the perpetrators now and there are atrocities apparently, but the perpetrators of course are not Nazis, this time they're Russians. Um, is there something particularly violence prone about that part of the world, uh, Rabbi, or are we simply talking, and I'll direct this to both of you, are we simply talking about uh, the human condition, the, the fall of man, or are we, is this, well, anyway, what would you say about uh, that? in light of current developments? Well, so given um, your image of the fall of man, uh, I, would, I would say that, and it's, it, it's intriguing to me um, that several philosophers, secular philosophers as well uh, as religious ones have invoked that exact same term uh, and have kind of done it in a sort of interesting kind of way. A, a, a very famous secular philosopher said, 
I don't actually abide by the tradition as we read in the Bible of the fall of man, but something happened in the 20th century in which man fell. Um, and I think that awareness um, of our um, proclivity for evil, um, I think one for me, and uh, I would love to hear uh, Daryl speak to this as well. So there's a remarkable I interchange that happens in 1947 or 1948 between one of the most distinguished Christian philosophers, maybe the most notable of the era, Reinhold Niebuhr, had been invited to speak at the Park Avenue Synagogue where the rabbi was Milton Steinberg. Um, and at that gathering, uh, Dr. Niebuhr spoke about original sin and the capacity for evil. I mean, he said something, Daryl, perhaps you can flesh it out for me. He said something to the effect that uh, original sin is the only, um, what is it, the, the only observable, provable fact of Christian theology, something along those lines. <laughs> um, uh, and um, it, it was at that moment that uh, Rabbi Steinberg stopped and said, I've always uh, kind of adopted the Jewish view that there's both a will to good and a will to evil, but given what we have just seen in the 1940s, uh, I have begun to think like Dr. Niebuhr. So I think um, what we have witnessed uh, about our weakness, our proclivity for sin, uh, for evil, our embrace of it uh, based upon racial categories, sexual, many different categories, not only, not only racial ones, and they go back many, many centuries, though, Martin Luther may not have known of racial categories. There were already in the Middle Ages racial categories. It was a, a, the taint of blood, which was uh, ascribed to Jews as limpensia de sangre, kind of poison blood, which didn't allow Jews who were even converted to Christianity to move within Christian life because there was something about them. So it's, um, it's a pretty awful piece about the difference between achieved and ascribed qualities. Let me add two things. The first is um, uh, about the quote, uh, uh, to sit alongside the quotation. I heard Elie Wiesel speak one time and the question and answer afterwards, someone said, given the kinds of uncertainties that you explore in Night, the, the memoir Night, what do you think about belief in God? And he said, well, after the Holocaust, it's uh, possible not to believe in God, and it's possible to believe in God, but it's not possible to be indifferent to the question, was uh, resp his response. I've always thought that was a marvelous um, way of answering a question. Not a complete way, but a marvelous way. Um, and the second thing I'll say is that it seems to me that there is this unfortunately proclivity to evil, but it is exacerbated uh, by uh, contemporary or contextual developments. So it'd be possible to say that lots of things in, in um, Eastern Europe might have contributed to the way in which that evil came to the fore, uh, such as nationalisms of, of uh, various sorts and antagonisms that have developed over centuries of uh, conquering uh, people in the middle of uh, uh, Eastern Europe being conquered either from the East or from the West. Um, and, and, and all sorts of other things that might contribute to the way in which it happened to develop in that place. But um, it seems to me that uh, it's still the case that humans have this proclivity to evil that Rabbi Citrin was talking about, and that our calling is to do what we can to resist it. And we should really? describe it in Europe because we can think about Northern Ireland and Ireland and differences between two fellow Christian groups. So it's uh, quite distinct. Yeah. I believe this next question is probably uh, appropriately directed toward Dr. Judek. Um, why, did, why did Luther violate his principles with regard to the Jews? Not did he, but why did he? That's a very good question. I don't know the answer to it. 
Um, but people have suggested a lot of reasons. One is that he was by that point old and ill uh, and uh, react, overreacted to things. Another is that uh, he was very tired of the weight of carrying the leadership of the Reformation and discouraged by some of its results that were not what he'd hoped to, for. Uh, some people have suggested that he was discouraged because he thought that once uh, uh, a, a more attractive version of the Christian message was uh, released uh, and uh, the oppression that people had experienced in the Catholic Church state relationships had ended, that they would be uh, persuaded to join the Christian movement. That didn't happen. So there are all sorts of suggestions as to what was going on. Um, he mm -hmm. also was very worried about uh, God's judgment on Europe because of the failures that were happening uh, in that time, war and so on, that had happened in his own lifetime. Uh, there, uh, I, I don't know, but there are all sorts of suggestions by, that scholars and biographers make as to why he was so uh, on edge. And mm -hmm. so, um, but he also just had the, con uh, the, 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 the um, characteristic of... Uh, writing in very flamboyant and over-the-top ways uh, in all through his life. So uh, part of the fact that he used over-the-top language in this case was also not terribly unusual um, uh, in his life. But uh, I don't know the answer. We have received more than one question uh, regarding, I think, which is something that's a very, very um, long-standing uh, question. Uh, the, the Jewish people, uh, a race, a culture, a religion. Uh, one of our questioners says Jewish people are not a race. We come from many racial groups. We are connected by culture. Uh, another question, another questioner says, um, um, oh, I'm sorry, I've lost the, uh, I, I'll, I'll just end it there and let uh, Rabbi, uh, um, oh, yeah, how do you reconcile that Judaism is not racial, uh, yet your comments regarding anti-Semitism suggest racial differentiation? Well, if the Jews are not a race, perhaps they are treated as a race. Would you care to comment on that um, consideration, Rabbi? I think I think both of us probably would want to, to say a word about it. So there, there's no question um, that uh, I think the way we would say it today is Race is a term that we create and use and assign different meanings to over the course of centuries. Uh, it, to use the language of the academy, race is socially, the, cat, the term is racial, socially constructed. People go about creating it, filling in the category, making it up and then using it. So in the 19th century, um, indeed, there were even some Jews who employed the term race because they didn't want to be, they were trying to become American citizens. Uh, they didn't want to merge and become Christians. Uh, they didn't think that they should speak of themselves as a national group because they wanted to be Americans. Uh, so they said, we are somehow distinctive. The, the language that we use today, I think, which is much more common, and this is also, so, as it were, socially constructed and new, we speak of ethnic groups or cultural groups. Uh, and I think that's the way in which one would identify the Jewish people today and happens to be the case. Um, one of the remarkable things in history, in the in 20th and 21st century uh, Jewish life, notwithstanding the complications, has been the creation of the state of Israel and the ingathering of people scattered across the generations and across the centuries and across the globe. And they are of they, they look different, they speak different languages, they share some things that are, I guess we would say religious and common culture, um, but uh, we, we shouldn't identify race with skin color and race is a term that was a, in, employed in the 1930s and the 40s, not only, not only in Germany, but in America as well. Hitler clearly learned, Germans clearly learned much of what they, employed in terms of technology and in terms of their social categories from what they saw was had happened here in the 19th and 20th century 
with regard to whites and blacks uh, and to the racial categories of America. Yes, quickly, in the 19th century, um, race was defined and so by some of the theorists as a matter of language. So the category was uh, of, of being Semitic, was speaking a particular language, and Aryan where the people that spoke a different kind of language, and they lumped these folks together into two huge groups that they said had been in conflict for centuries. And uh, the idea was that uh, the Aryans needed to win um, in order uh, to, to preserve their superior status. But it was based on language, which was, um, uh, which was different. We are very close to the end of our time. I'm going to try to get in uh, certainly one more question, but I'll keep, ask you to keep that in mind, gentlemen. Maybe we'll get to the second one if there's time. Um, um, I'll start with uh, Professor Jodak. Uh, what do you say to people who claim that there's something in the German character that causes war? I think it's nonsense. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, I really don't know how to respond other than to say um, there's no evidence uh, uh, that uh, many, many other people are not equally prone to war. Uh, one simply has to list the wars and the nations that have, have been involved in those wars uh, to, um, to see that it's not unique to Germany. And, and, and one also has to factor in fascism as a political development in the 20th century, which glorified war and military might in a way that wasn't true of other places, which of course affected Italy and Spain and other places as well. Did you wanna add anything, Rabbi? No, I think, that's, I think that's exactly right. I think my brief comment to the claim that was made with lots of bestsellers that, that Germans were anti-Semites from the day of their, their birth was, is, has been soundly rejected by thoughtful historians who look at the evidence and simply that doesn't, doesn't work that way. And uh, so um, I, I highlighted Yehuda Bauer who stood in opposition to what, what they would have considered to be just foolish kinds of conclusions. I'm afraid we are out of time. I think I'm going to save a couple of the questions uh, that I didn't get a chance to ask. Maybe we'll get a chance to ask them next week. Uh, we are uh, out of time today. I want to thank uh, both of our speakers. Also, I want to thank the audience's, uh, audience members who, who uh, pose such interesting questions. Um, please join us next week uh, when we will present part two. The topic will be Rebuilding uh, Jewish-Christian Relations with Rabbi Citron and Professor Daryl Jodak. And be looking this week, I will say to the audience, I believe there are some handouts coming your way, including the questions to consider uh, for next time. But for right now, I'm gonna say thank you everyone and goodbye for today. <laughs>